I texted Randy Couture from Chuck Liddell's phone that he took a Viagra before their second fight because he wanted to take their relationship to the next level. The book is called Unbreakable, but I definitely know it's like to be broke. I say, I don't have the same education, I don't have the same experience, so how can I do it differently than everybody else? Depression, anxiety, ADHD, insomnia, though it's bipolar. I got a cornucopia of issues. We're all going through something. I got sick of it. That's why I wanted to fight back. Your work with MVP has made a real difference. Let's get, you know, combat vets, they look up to pro athletes. Pro athletes look up to combat vets. Let's put them together, remind them what their greatest is. It's not the same job, but it's the same suck when the uniform comes off. What I really started to open up about issues was in a cage with Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. And we'd be in there after we were trained and we'd be crying to each other. That's true masculinity. This vulnerability, that's the strongest thing we're doing. All right, we'll get to Jake Laser in a moment, but first, gotta remind you, hit the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel so you can teach YouTube that you love Dad Saves America. Okay, Jay, welcome to Dad Saves America. Appreciate it, man. So Dads I'm, are important. <laughs> <laughs> I And you're a dad, and you've written this incredible book. Thank you. You know, I want to get into it in as much detail as we can, but I just want to start a little bit with your career. So, right. you know, you've had this amazing <laughs> run, and I know you've talked enough. You see places. the amazing part now. Right. Right. You, so, don't, you don't see the very, very, very unamazing, lonely part for the first 11 years. Well, let's talk about that for yeah. a little bit. Give me a flyover. I know you've spoken right. about this a lot. You know, set, right. set up for our viewers. Yeah. Where did you start? So, look, I, the book is called Unbreakable, but I definitely know what it's like to be broke. <laughs> and, and whenever I talk about mental health now, people go, oh, come on, man. You're rich and famous. And first of all, our wallet is not an antidepressant. So that, that's one thing. Sometimes um, it makes things worse. It, sometimes, because now you have something to lose. Yeah. When we were broke, we had nothing to lose and you were able to go after a lot more. And you didn't have that fear. But yeah, I went, my first 11 years of my career, I made a whopping 9,450 bucks a year, living in New York City. Now, how did you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, how were you actually- I, I kind of look back, because my baby sister, Michael Strahan, we, he was there for a lot of it. <laughs> we talk about it a lot, and he's like, because he actually, back then, offered to pay my rent one year. I was you like, don't ever offer to pay something for me, ever. I got this. Don't you ever offer to do this. And uh, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And, but we look back now, he's like, you wouldn't take money for anybody. How did you pay your bills? I kind of played bill roulette. So the only thing I made sure I paid that didn't get shut off was my phone bill. Because I needed that being an NFL insider. So the heat got turned yeah. off all the time. Electricity got turned off all the time. And whatever bills was there back then got turned off all the time. And rent was getting... You'd have penalty fees, late fees, all this, oh, yeah. all that. So you're um, but also rent was buried. Like, my, I lived in places I had no business living. Like my, my first place on my own was 340 bucks a month. And we had a curfew for the drug dealers to be in by a certain time. I had no business living in this place. What I was like, that was tough. I wasn't that tough. What neighborhood? Uh, it was in uh, Brooklyn somewhere. And um, which now you go back to this area and it's- Two million dollars. Oh my condos. God, it's incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. So here's what happened. I, the first- Four years was really me making nothing and interning and I was doing stand-up comedy and sports and boxing and bouncing and barting and doing everything you could. When I finally got covered to hire the Giants in 1993, I walked in the Giant locker room that first day and I said, okay, I don't have the same education as everybody else. I got kicked out of my first school and then went to Pace University in my second school, really to major in eligibility. And I said, I don't have the same education I don't have the same experience, so how can I do it differently than everybody else? I can't do it their way. I'm not gonna try and keep up with the Joneses. How could I do it different? So one, I said, man, these cats work 40 hours a week. I'm not gonna outwork them by a little. I'm gonna outwork them by a lot. So I'll be there 100 hours a week. Just outwork them. Yeah. But that's why I made the 9450, because I couldn't get another job. Well, that's the uh, hard part, right? When you've got something you're really going after. I'm going after, and that's what you have to do. And so this is 1993. I didn't get a full-time job till 99. So, but I also said, how could I be different than everybody else? Man, I said, these guys are, they're doing it their way. I'm gonna start relationships. And that's how the business is now. Back then, no one had relationships. It wasn't relationship-based. I, th I thought the reporters back then used their pen as a weapon. And I said, I'm not gonna use my pen as a weapon. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm like, we're covering sports, who cares? So let's take, yeah. I'm not take covering a, the Middle East. Take a step back for All a right. sec. Why did you 
have a vision for doing sports journalism at, like that? Because I mean, no, you no, had, no. Not that I had the vision. Because again, I was. Uh, but what boxing. was that ring where you were grabbing for? No, what was boxing. It? I was doing comedy. I was doing sports. Whatever was going to hit, that's where I was going. Okay. So whichever took off, that's where I was going to go. So how would you describe what that drive was? Was it just to succeed, to build a career? When you, you know you were placing bets in a couple yeah. of places, but was there some? What was was there like a unified thing for you at that point? So just in this is where I know we'll get into mental health later. But <clears throat> and I talked. The, the title is how I turn my depression and anxiety into motivation. Yeah, and you can too. So, but you had motivation. Well, but here's the motivation: because my depression and anxiety tell me I'm worthless and I'm not worthy of being loved. I don't know what it feels like to be loved from the inside out. So it motivated me to go do all these great things from the outside in to get love from out there to fill me up and hope they meet in the middle one day. So that actually motivated me. So there was, my depression and anxiety helped me, got me. If I didn't have that worthless feeling in here, I wouldn't have been so motivated because I was trying to drive to feel this love, to feel this validation, to not feel so lousy about myself all the time, which is, you know, unfortunately that's how it's always been. I don't know any other way to think. It's not like something traumatic happened to me. It's just how my life has always been as a little kid on. It's all I've always known. I mean, especially after COVID, this is yeah. the thing that I think all of us, this is the genuine, I don't like the word crisis, but I do think we have a mental health crisis. And so yeah, look, I'm talking about it because of my suffering that's clinical. Not everybody has that. I think that's why it allows me to talk about it is because of the clinical depression, anxiety, ADHD, insomnia, throwing some bipolar. Um, I, I run the gamut. I, I got a cornucopia of issues. But I used to think like, man, why do I have all these issues? And I was meditating one day. I was like, hey, I've been in this amount of pain so I could help others with theirs. But the point is, you don't have to have this level for me or what I'm saying now or the book or the podcast or any of this to affect you because social media, we all think our lives suck. We're all sitting on this thing and our phone and man, we're going, well, how come my meal doesn't look like that? Why am I not this successful? How come I don't have this car? Why am I not at that party? Well, we feel so damn left out. And it's in both directions. So you're getting all the FOMO stuff. and It's then also you're... a filter. Yeah. It's a fraction of a day. What about the other almost 24 hours right. of a day? It's one fraction of one second of one minute of a day. And it makes us think, that we're not doing enough, that we're not good enough, and that we're losers, and we're not. So that's giving it to us. And the other thing that's given it to us is Twitter. Like, look, you grew up in Philly, I grew up down in the, I don't like to say it, but it rhymes with Persie poor, outside of New York City. <laughs> oh when, man, when the Jersey got... <laughs> Shore, you gotta give the Jersey Shore a little more love, Jake, come when, on. <laughs> when you got your ass clicked, kicked in the playground down there, man, it sucked for a month. But now on Twitter, you're getting your butt kicked or seeing someone get their butt kicked a hundred times a minute. It's awful. Well, we can't tell the difference, right? So we're seeing news from around the world that's right. horrible and it feels like it's happening right in our room. We're regular news, but it's intertwined with, even if you put something else out, and I was just talking to people about this today. The way people talk to you on Twitter, would you ever go to someone's business and go, hey, everybody, this person sucks at his job. He's a fat and overweight. Look at his haircut. Man, his mom's a loser. Like, who would do that? You wouldn't do that, ever. Yeah. yeah. And we see that constantly. You never have a post where somebody doesn't say things like that. That's not how we act as humans. But man, we do over there. So it's, we're all going through something. I got sick of it, that's why I wanted to fly back. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the things we talk about on this show is about how do you take control right. and not see yourself as a victim of circumstance, but as someone that has right. agency. You took that on early. Yeah, and that's exactly right. like I knew where where I was lacking a certain thing, so I have to, like today, I listen, today, I had a bad day this morning. I had a really bad day this morning. I had to get on with my therapist this morning, let some other people know I'm really struggling today. Uh, I don't sign, I didn't sign up for this, and I don't know when it's gonna happen. I just wake up, and by the way, man, our show won Nemi last night. Congratulations, man, that's awesome. That's sky high today. <laughs> and instead, I woke up in the worst gray I've been in in a long time, and had nothing to do with anything else. I just, man, woke up in the tank. But I know now to go do things. But also every day in my life, it is, it's hard for me to get out of bed in the morning. So I made a decision long ago, I can either lay in bed or I can get my butt out of bed and then go be relentless once I make that decision. So I decided to be relentless every single day of my life. And again, that's that thing I said before, of, hey, I'm not gonna outwork these guys by a little. 
I'm going to outwork them by a lot. I'm going to be absolutely relentless. And then the other thing my mental health issues did, it always made me feel like I was down, so I never minded getting knocked down. So I was rejected yeah. more than any human being I've ever met in my life on the way to this, this journey. And again, it was 11 years to get a full-time paycheck. And during that 11 years, I was applying and calling and calling and being a pain in the butt and being relentless. Relent but I didn't mind getting rejected because I felt like I belonged there. So that I look back now and go, wow, where did these mental health issues actually work for me? And everybody out there, we can look and see what they, where we thought they hurt us and flip the script on it and say, man, they actually helped us in certain ways. A lot of people say, how can you complain? Your life is great. My life is great, but between my ears sucks. Yeah. And I, again, I didn't sign up for that. So I'm going to try and help people that between the ears, we see something different than maybe what's, what's reality also. Um, but I get this call from my agent, and even getting that guy's name is Maury Gostrand. What year is this? You're on 99. Okay. So I've gotten turned down by agent after agent after agent after agent. And man, it's, it is brutal. Um, but I just pick myself up, brush myself, let's keep going, let's keep fighting. And he calls me up and he says, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm on a little driving range with Tiki Barber. And he said, you could finally exhale. I said, what's up? He said, you finally got a full-time job. I get a little choked up even talking about it because this is my moment. I said, oh. he, I said, with who? He said, CBS Sports, they got the NFL back and you're gonna be their NFL insider. You're not gonna be on camera, you're gonna be their NFL insider, they're gonna mention you and you're gonna have this thing called a ticker, a crawl, which is gonna break your news, which really didn't think existed before that. Um, and now it's oh, everywhere, yeah. right? Right, right. And I said, I'll take it. And he said, don't you wanna know how much it's for? I said, I don't care, because it validated me when I walked in the giant locker room six years earlier, seven years earlier, and I said, man, I'll be the last dude standing in here, and I'm gonna do it differently. It validated me. So that was my moment that was bigger for me than any amount of money could have been. That's the equity. I wanna ask a hard question, I Good. Uh, which is, for a lot of people that are experiencing the kind of anguish internally that yeah. you were, and it's when it's combined <clears throat> with them. It ain't over. Right, but I, I, what I say is, when I say where, I guess I mean, you've got this going on still to this day, yeah, but yeah. then you also had making 10 grand a year right. in New York City. Right. A lot of people fall into the cycle of addiction. Yep. You know, did you, did you ha struggle with that? Or, did, or if you didn't, how did you avoid it? Because for so many people, when they're no. right at that margin and a, and a bill bounces yeah. or they get ev evicted from their apartment because <clears throat> they didn't make rent for three months, yeah. that's that spiral downward. We had yeah. Dr. Drew on the show and he talked. He was talking about a lot of experiences and with no. people that are high level. I didn't turn to drugs for anything like that. I always drank socially and yeah, I'd hit the bar. But I hit the bar in the good times and bad times because for me, that was a social thing. I need teams around me and even that for me, it was like a good, it was a community. Um, but you didn't find, you didn't like get connected into like that sort of not because, self -medicating been, or... not because I've been rejected. I had issues with Vicodin that, again, I, I started fighting at an early age and then just kind of got handed out. I don't even know by who or when, but this was the mid 90s and there was no opioid crisis back then. I'm like, it's a pain. We play a pain, a, a sport of pain is a painkiller. Sign me up. Sounds great. And it felt great. And then over time, I used them for uh, social anxiety issues and then realized over time, like, okay, when I would use those and I would combine with alcohol and I'm going through my issues, if I'm out, these would get involved too much and that's not good for anybody. So yeah. I stopped with that. And it actually took me until a year and a half ago was the first time I was supposed to go out with Stray Ham for dinner. And I was having a really, really, really bad social anxiety and depression day. And at this point, it, the beast really got out of the box, really, really bad. And it's the first time I ever called him and said, I can't go to dinner tonight. The beast got out of the box. In the past, I would have popped a Viking and had some alcohol and gone out and dealt with it. And it's the first time I said, I can't go out. The beast got in the box, out of the box. And he said, and when I have a really bad anxiety and depression bout, I feel it physically. Yeah. I feel it on the left side of my gut. I feel it behind my rib, rib cage. And I feel it in my joints like I just had a 50 round fight in the rain. And man, it sucks. It's debilitating. And I just said, can't go out tonight, man. The beast got out of the box. And he said... Um, yeah, so what'd you do? He said, uh, you, you want to talk about it? And I said, no, I, I do, but I want to go to sleep right now. 
I want to sleep this one off and, and live to fight another day. And he said, do you want me to come over, though? I said, no, not yet, not just. And then he said, why have you never told me about this? The first time I ever told him. Never this told is the him. first time? That's the first time. And he's been and your first buddy time for... I didn't use Viking and alcohol and go out and deal with it. And I said, no, he's been my best friend since 1993. He's now 30 years. And he said, why have you never told me? And I said, I don't make up the rules of this thing. With you, I felt shame. I felt ashamed. And probably because we're so competitive. And he said, yeah, but you took my ability away to be your best friend for all these years. I could have been there for you for all these years. So now I don't go another day without telling him or someone else. I tell everyone, um, and that's how I deal with it now. So no more, no more that for me. Now I call, <clears throat> and you know I want people to understand the busiest people in the world. When you say to them, "Man, I'm struggling. I have this," they will make time for you. And if they don't, they're not the right ones for you. But like the Rock wrote my forward, <clears throat> and he said, "I don't normally do these, but you're going to be a voice." for the grave for all of us, all of us. And now he's starting to talk about his issues as well, but he's the busiest guy in the world. I call him when I'm struggling, dude. And we have a thing like, we don't go a day without responding, uh, either one of us. And you know, there's some people I know I could lean into more than others. Um, yeah. But for the most part, man, it's been, I don't know, 90% of when I call people say I'm really struggling. They're there, someone hit me up today, uh, Andrew Whitworth former left tackle from the Rams, hit me up today, was honest. I said, dude, I'm, it's one of those days, man, I'm just struggling. And he is down here doing something today. He said, uh, I could <laughs> get choked up talking about this, like how much people were there for you. But he said, I could be your house by this afternoon. Like, man. So here is a big difference in, I think how beautiful that is. Instead of me yeah, using substances or anything like that. And again, I, I didn't have addiction per se, but this is, a, this is a much better way for me to handle things, but look at the response. And it, again, I wanna really put this out there because people are afraid to turn into people. And that just hasn't, my experience has been so amazing. It's not because I'm Jay Glazer. It's not the reason. People truly wanna help you and be there because I think in this point in life also, more and more of us are facing things or we know someone who's facing things, and the more we can talk about it, the more it's gonna help them. You see, you don't have a tr you don't have something that's a trigger so much. No, because my first encounter yeah. with, with what you're talking about is my, my wife Lisa has had panic attacks. She's your trigger. <laughs> I'm her trigger. You better edit this one out. <laughs> Lisa better not see this. I've watched her have panic attacks yeah. because it's and it's triggered by the cold. And she said the first time really? she experienced it, she was small enough that she was holding her dad, uh, who's who's a football guy, Tony Versace. He mm -hmm. was a, a coach and. Um, uh, she she was this she was this little holding his hand like this in the cold and she's from Michigan, and she described it as total fight or flight like a yeah. lion is running at you yeah. about to rip your throat out. Yeah, is that what you're experiencing when yeah. you wake you start, like when you woke up this morning? Is that the is that the sensation? Is it so? It, get, it grips you here, um, and when you have those, mine was more of a depression thing today than the panic anxiety attacks, but the anxiety attacks, which I have, I've had every week on air from 2005 to now, and I don't know why. Again, you like say trigger, man, I'm great in chaos. I shine in chaos, but I suck in calm. So I don't know why it happened, because it's chaos. And I was actually in an empty radio stadium. There was nobody but me and a cameraman. That was it. And I was doing a, a live hit for Fox NFL Sunday, um, but also doing a, a Raider game. And, um, your eyes start going back and forth, your hands start shaking, you start getting really labored and you're breathing and you're talking, you start sweating and you feel like you're having a heart attack. In the first 12 years of this, I was having my heart checked out for having a heart attack because right. we didn't talk about mental health then. So we didn't know what it was. And I spoke to someone this week, a young man who uh, doctors wanted to remove his gallbladder because he was having these panic attacks and they thought it was his gallbladder and it was just panic attacks. And luckily they didn't do it. But again, back then, doctors didn't know to look that for having these things. Yeah, gallbladder for whatever, whatever reason. Yeah. Since I've come out and talked about it and said, this is what it feels like, I can't tell him how many of my friends in television have said, oh, that's what it is. Thank God I know what it is now. Oh my God. And listen, the first guy who 
described it to me was my teammate, Terry Bradshaw. Terry talked about it years ago before we knew what it was. He was the brave one to step out 20 years ago and start talking about it. And he was so far ahead of his time, we didn't recognize it back then. And we were somewhere and he talked about it. I'm like, oh, oh wait, I think that's what I have. I don't think it's my heart. Oh. I mean, my, my heart, they were checking my heart out for 12 years and kept coming back with nothing. And I'm like, it's gotta be something because I keep having these things. And for Terry, when I heard it from him, it was a, <sighs> thank God. And then I learned you're safe when you have them. So what do you mean really by that? Like, what do you mean you're safe? You're when not you gonna have die. Them. Oh. You're not gonna pass out. You're not gonna die. You're not gonna pass out on television. You're not gonna get choked out on TV. You're safe. So every time it happens to me now, I start wrestling with my abuser, I call it, and I start to, nope, you're not gonna do it. I'm safe, I'm safe. And what I do while I'm on live TV is I try and push a joke out fast. So if you ever see me push out like a bad joke, actually, I don't have any bad jokes, but if you, uh, <laughs> if you see me push out a joke out at the start of a show, it's because I'm going through it. And now, though, I know to tell Kurt Menefee or Howie Long, guys, I'm having one. And just to tell him makes it, 75% less effective. So you'll be able, you're able to tell somebody, it's, it's so, my whole thing in here is that let's walk this walk together. And if you have others to fight this fight back with, you know, you have an army, now yeah. you could deal with this. It's way better than suffering in silence. That suffering in silence thing, it's not just a cliche. You suffer in silence. So I don't want people to be silent anymore. I want us to talk out. So that's my long version answer to that. It's, it's a really interesting challenge because to what extent do you feel like this is about confronting, you know, what we understand to be masculinity. You know, as far as well, not being able to engage uh, with mental yeah, health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the guys you're talking about are mm. big, powerful, mas sure. you know, ma masculine right. guys. How do you think about masculinity in all of this? Think about the opposites of my life. So I've trained, Randy Couture and I started a mixed martial arts cross training program for pro athletes in 2007. We've trained uh, hundreds of thousands of pro athletes and other people like, man, so many people. Our whole unbreakable way that we fight in there is we are, again, relentless, relentless, relentless. But if I am hurt or tired, you will never, ever know. Our fighters, our players, don't put your hands on your hips. Don't show anyone. Because the moment I see your hands, you have your hands on your hips, I'm like, oh, you're starting to break. And I forget I'm getting tired because I start getting all excited that you're getting tired. And that's when I sharpen my weapons. I tell our guys, <laughs> no stool, no, don't show it. We don't show it. If I'm hurt, you will never, ever, ever, ever know. And now I'm sure trying to preach the exact opposite. The exact opposite. When it comes to life, show it, tell it, let's see it, so we can all have a fight team together. So, but again, that's part of that masculinity that we were always ingrained and taught as little kids on is no, you don't show it, you suck it up, you pull your bootstraps up, and that's great for sports. It is great for sports. Absolutely great for sports. It's terrible for the rest of our lives. It is, it's sort of like a warrior code. It's yes. like, okay, yeah. you're going onto the battlefield. Uh, you might not survive, but survival's not the point. Victory is the point, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean. Or even victory of like, you go down, you die on your shield. Absolutely. Where I really started to open up about issues was in a cage with Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. And we'd be in there after we were trained, and we'd be crying to each other. And people would walk past and be like, wow, these guys really beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> it's like they were crying because <laughs> the beatings, but it wasn't. It was the stuff that we were talking about. We opened up to each other at those moments. And that's when um, man, I really realized that's true masculinity. This is this vulnerability. This is the strongest thing we're doing. How do you think about courage in that in that way? Like, what does courage mean for you? Because I feel like it's very courageous a... to open up. Very courageous. Again, I never told Strahan until last a year and a half ago. It's very courageous because our brain tends to make up storylines and finish the story for us, and often those stories just aren't true. That's a lot. The brain's the most powerful weapon in the world, and it could be used to make all our dreams come true. But it could really be used also to hurt ourselves, and. For you to be able to stand up to your own, I say the roommates in my head, to stand up to them, that's really courageous. And to find other ways and other answers. And, and a lot of it too, again, I'm 53. So for 51 years, I had a certain way of thinking. 
and now I'm just learning a, a better way to think. You know, one of the things that's in, in your book and uh, is ways of, it's throughout it, is ways of succeeding. What's your advice for people yeah. about how to power through and, and build success for themselves? Well, first, don't power through. That's, that's one thing, don't power through. And the pain that you're in, it's real. Like some of the things I do now, look, I talk about building a team, having a team, finding that team. Yeah. Right? And your team, and, and I found a lot of people go, I have no teams. We all have teams. I choose to have faith. God's a team for me. And I don't ask God to make me rich or get me a job. I just, hey, I want you to be my best friend, parent. What's your best friend and parent do for you? They listen. That's all I want. I'm not asking for anything else. And I would actually, in those 11 years of making the 9,700 bucks a year, um, I would, every week, I'd say, God, just, I don't need you to get me this job. Just, I get knocked down, pick me up, brush me off, and let's keep walking this walk together. Yeah. There's power in numbers. I got a rescue pit who just passed, but she's my team. My son is my team. My fight team is my team. My Fox Animal Sunday team is my team. Groups of friends are my teams. We do have teams that are out there for us. When you have these mental health issues, a lot of time you're self-loathing. You don't want to believe that anybody loves you or anybody likes you or you have these teams. We do have these teams. So I lean into these teams. And listen, the first time I did it, I went down to the Tampa Super Bowl and I was going through it. And I call Rondé Barber and three other friends of ours in our little group down there. And Rondé has been one of my closest friends. I said, hey, I land today. Um, I need to link up with you guys for dinner time. And they all told me they had other plans. And I said, no, I'm struggling. I need to meet for dinner tonight. And all four guys said, we're there. They canceled plans and we're there. Two of them said, man, I go through it too. I'm struggling too. So bam, now all of a sudden we have a little support group we could talk to there. And me and one of the guys, Ben, we constantly are, are keeping up on each other. So you have these teams you can lean in, in on. And the other thing that people think is people don't want to hear. Negativity. Like, or, or just want to hear, oh, not again. It's never happened to me. Every single time I've called some, again, I've been talking to Whit about this, Andrew Whitworth for a while, and he today, I'll be there in four hours, bam. People want to be there for you. Because another thing in my book here is being of service. And that's what we could do. Being of service, listening to other people, hearing people out, being there for other people is a way to be of service. I live several things in the books to be of service because that really gets me through my darkest times. But some of them involve money. A lot of them don't. There's a great story um, about you and Strahan making Christmas special. You want to share that with our audience? No, no, it was me and T. Here's yeah. what I did. Again, what, what did you do for Christmas? There, there's, there's ways that I knew we could, I could be of service. I think I just got the job at CBS, so that was for 50 grand, by the way. And so I went to the um, post office in New York, the zip code 10001. And when kids send letters to Santa, it goes there. But they actually divide them up. And you can go in, and I would get these letters from these oh, kids. They'll, they'll give you the, they'll give the you letters. Christmas letters, yeah, yeah. the Santa letters. letters. It sounds like that would be like a federal crime or something, but not, not if it's to Santa. Okay. So, um, <laughs> listen, Santa's breaking into people's houses anyway through the chimney, so it's yeah, breaking right. and entering. Yeah. I'm Jewish, so I'm like, what's wrong with you people? You let this guy break and enter in your house? And I would go there, get these letters, and, and they'd, a lot of them would be really heartbreaking. They just want pants with no holes for the night. They don't get made fun of or a blanket or a glove. Or, man, it, a lot of them are heartbreaking. And I would actually go and I would fulfill, started with like three of these letters. And then I took my fight team and cause some of these are really bad areas. I, would, I couldn't go myself. And we went in there and I would knock on these doors and I would say, hey, did you, is there a such and such here? Well, Santa sent us, we got your letter. And oh man, talk about. There's no way to be in the gray when you do something like that. Well, eventually, as people started hearing what I was doing, they all wanted to start doing it. So I started getting more and more and more letters and started giving them out to different friends and people who had restaurants and this and that, and it started becoming a thing. And then it went back, Tiki would come with me. So all of a sudden, you get the starting running back of the Giants, and he's showing up. Yeah, like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever don the Santa Claus outfit? No, 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 no. Not never even, like, not even an elf hat? No, no, never did that, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But there's ways like I'll, so it's like yeah. But it, like Santa my son sent and I, a bouncer to bring you. Right, your... exactly. A lot of bouncers. But all these guys too were like, "You're doing what? We're in." But listen, social media makes us think we're bad these days, and that our lives suck, and people bully us so much. 
but people want to do good. People are inherently good. Yeah. We're just forgetting that because we're so wrapped up in what we're seeing over here, but we're inherently good. And you know, another quick thing I do with my son, again, for people, you don't have to have a ton of money to do this. My son and I would go to the 99 cent store and we'd get toothbrush, toothpaste, handy wipes, deodorant, uh, socks, hand sanitizer, soap, and like pad and pen. And we'd put them together and hand them out to the homeless. It's eight bucks, cost eight dollars, that's it. Hand them out to the homeless. And I wanted to teach my son this. So there's ways we could be of service, but the gray does not have any room in my head in those days, and usually a couple days after. So being of service really lifts us up. And then like, listen, volunteer for a charity. I, when I'm having my really bad gray days, I call four friends to tell them that I'm struggling, but then I call four other people just to check up on them without telling them I'm struggling. And that's my way of being a service. And especially in today's day and age, usually three out of four, but often four out of four are going, no, it's funny that you called. You know, right. I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that, I'm dealing with this. And it lifts us up. Tell me about Logan. You were talking about service. I started a charity a while ago. Uh, and again, here's another way you could be of service is whatever you do for a living or whatever your strengths are, figure out where that can help. So for me, I'm at football and I would find kids who are really fighting for their lives, similar to what Make-A-Wish does, but I would try and make it a little more long-term. So one year, um, there's this kid, Logan Nabriga, uh, who was at UCLA Children's Hospital, and he got reached out, it was pretty funny, got reached out through a friend of mine um, who was working at UCLA Children's Hospital, and hit her uh, significant other, Rick Jaffe, was one of the people who hired me at Fox, and say, hey, this kid Logan's a huge fan of yours. So instead of a sports team, we really want, he wants you, and he wants you to visit him at UCLA Children's Hospital. I said, great. Came in there, I had all these gifts for him. I walked in there, and he looked at me, and he's like, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> they totally lied to me just to get somebody there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> but Logan and I, man, he became my dude. We, man, we connected. How did you uh, handle yourself in that moment? He's like, Oh, I laughed. I'm just I... normally me. And I'm just like, All right, well, here's who I am, kid. Thanks, everybody, for setting me up on this. And, and he's um, like, Okay, you're yeah. not, a, yeah, all right. We really, really, really connected. The point where, like, I wanted to know his grades, his report card, all this. And his first, when he got a stent out. Uh, so, what was, he, what was he suffering from? Okay. Leukemia. Okay. Uh, two stents. I met him in his first. Second time, he went back in. Him and his mom, Kersha, became like the welcoming committee there at UCLA Children's Hospital because they knew where they're going already. Um, just incredible people. And when he got a stent taken out, I had him come to the gym and we had a surprise party with all these NFL players there. Um, he showed up for his last chemo radiation treatment with a Gronk jersey. And I called Gronk and I'm like, <laughs> any way you're in town? He's like, I actually am. I'm like, dude, here's the deal. Yeah. Gronk shot right over to the gym, unbreakable, bam. And I called Logan, I'm like, where you at? And he's like, oh, I'm down here. I was like, dude, you need to get to the gym now. And his mom was like, oh, I, you didn't show Jay your report card. And he walks in and there's Gronk and he sees him and he goes, we're like, hey. And he's like, wait, so I'm not in trouble? We're like, no, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> he's slipping his report card back behind his back. <laughs> yeah, and um, his first trip, I actually took him to the Pro Bowl with my son. Um, and Andy Reid was the coach there. So took, he took him on the cart and drove him out. And, did everything, and that was my dude, man. Logan's my dude. And now he is cancer-free, leukemia-free, amazing. We had Nate Boyer on the show uh, a, a short time ago, and I know in the, I know you've talked about that Logan played a role in- Logan started. Inspiring you. Logan really started. So, so, so tell me yeah, about how, you, how we Susie, go from Logan to what you're doing his with His grandma, Nate. Susie, was working with vets down in Virginia, and they called and said, hey, we know you, you, know, you have these players, and da-da-da, and it was really like, hey, what if we bring players to We're helping all these vets. And I was telling them what a lot of my friends were going through. So I started calling around the NFL and said, man, let's get somebody down there. We have this place. Uh, and I hadn't met, met Susie's grandmother yet. I knew Kirsty and Logan. Um, but it was amazing what she and everybody did down there in a place called Boulder Crest. And I said, if we can get somebody down, football-wise, and look, I know, and I first told Nate about it too, he's like, Wait, it's not the, this isn't the same job. You can't put these together. They said, no, you can put it together. It's not the same job, but it's the same suck when the uniform comes off. 
and they both look up to each other. So I'm like, dude, let's put them together and let's get, you know, combat vets, they look up to pro athletes, pro athletes look up to combat vets, let's put them together, remind them what their greatest is. And had I not met Logan through all this, none of this would happen. So first guy we did was a guy named Orrin O'Neill, played for the Raiders, he agreed, he was in a really bad place. I flew down there, it was, I think like 11 combat vets and Orrin, he was the rookie of the year for the Raiders one year when Lane Kiffin was the head coach. He blew out his knee back um, and never played again. He was really, really angry and bitter. And I walked in there to uh, Oren. So this is really the first time we put them together. But we wanted to see if this is going to work out or not. Are they going to, are the vets going to be like, fine, that's fine. And the football player is going to be comfortable with the vets. And, but I walk in there and, and Oren's in there and I'm like, so what's wrong with you? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, what's wrong with you? Like, what's so messed up with you that are you, you know, pretty much suicidal? He said, man, football took my life, took my identity. I said, what happened? He said, man, I got hurt, herniated L4, L5, blew out his, his old knee. So like ACL, MCL, PCL, patella, everything. I said, never did my knee, but yeah, I ruptured L4, L5 three times, uh, L1, L2 twice, and herniated C2, 3, 4, 5. What else you got? And he goes, well, I have this. Hit. Oh, yeah, well, I dis dislocated my elbow and tore my, uh, my uh, bicep. He goes, what else you got? And he goes, well, nothing else. I said, well, man, I broke my ankle twice, woke up during the surgery, actually, when I was, or, it was getting better from it. Tore my calf, tore this bicep, tore this shoulder, tore this labrum. Had that, and he goes, what? I just broke my nose seven times. And he goes, man, you act like you're proud of it. I said, you're damn right I am. Absolutely. I'm proud of every scar I have because what else am I going to do? You got to be proud of your scars, man. I said, you got these injuries playing in the NFL. Little Oren probably would have been his dream. And if you told little Oren, you're going to blow out all this stuff, but you get to play in the NFL, he'd say, sign me up. Right? Perspective. So, perspective. Am I just supposed to weigh, change the way I think? I said, right now. Right now, Oren. Right freaking now. And he did. And it changed his life. We just had an MVP fundraiser a week ago and saw him down there. Looks amazing. Lost a ton of weight. He's doing incredible work now. Man, so proud of him. It's that perspective. For me, listen, do I wish I didn't break my nose seven times? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, it sucked. Do I wish I didn't wake up during surgery for my ankle? Absolutely. That was traumatic. So I wish it didn't happen, but I'm freaking proud of it. Every time I sit with you or anybody else, I walk in there and stuff, it's stuff I've overcome. My scars are my currency. My money's not my currency. My achievements aren't my currency. The stuff I've overcome, that's your currency. We all have scars. We don't all have the successes we may want, but we all have scars that we can lean into to build us up. When we walk in a room, have a little, more, a little bit more pride in ourselves. This is one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you because so many of our kids they feel pain, um, they feel there's a mental health crisis among yeah. young kids in particular. What's your message for someone who feels yeah. like, like they have pain yeah. and they feel like they're a victim and, they're, and, they, yeah. and they, they can't do anything? I've been asked the question, what's the best gift you can give your son? And I said, adversity. Greatest thing you could ever give him. Again, I went through 11 years to get me where I am and made me who I am. Nowadays, you transfer. You go to the transfer portal and you just transfer with another team if you don't like what's going on. You don't have the Michael Jordan story getting benched in, you know, in high school to make him who he is. That adversity makes us who we are. That makes us gangsters. That makes us fighters. It's the same with suicide now. People are just like, I'm not going through some out. And like, man, if you can go through this pain and get through the other side, that will lead to your dreams coming true. Why do you think we don't do, we don't do that with our kids the way we used to? I think we are afraid of how they're gonna handle it. My own son, man, I'm just afraid because we're, they're controlled by the outside forces and their influences and so much, so many influences. And look, even like the suicide, I, I try to villainize suicide. And I've gone through it, we even want our vets this, because I'm like, hey, it's selfish. They're like, it's not selfish, it's a mental illness. And it, I hear you. I'm just trying to villainize as much as I can. If you want to be mad at me, you can be mad. And for people who have mental illness, sometimes there's, it is, it's like, you know, you're dying by suicide. But a lot of times we confuse our problems for mental illness and we're killing ourselves over problems, over money issues, business problems, and that to me, I say it's selfish. And I try and put that out because I want people to think about it, somebody else, like, man, when you do that, you're leaving us with your problems, and you, your problems are dumb. I also have a friend named Kevin Hines who uh, tried to jump off the Golden, who jumped off the Golden State Bridge, and he said him and every other survivor, the moment they jumped, they immediately regretted it. So oh. I'm like, Imagine being in that one, that that moment right yeah. there. That's yeah. right. That's a nightmare. People have issues. They kill themselves. And whenever this happens to like a teammate to one of our vets, let's say, 
I say, be careful of your, call your, all your teammates, call them. Cause it's the power suggestion. Cause when somebody else does it and you think your life sucks, you're gonna go, man, my life sucks. Jimmy over there is getting a ton of love right now and everybody's out having outpouring of love. Well, I want that love too, so I'm gonna do this. And that's why you see kind of groups do it. And that's where it's scary for our kids. And you're afraid to push your kids because something that really wasn't an option when we were growing up, we see constantly yeah. now. And it's, it's only, it's, it's become an option and it should never be an option. Like again, the things that we talking about overcoming, thank God we're still here to do a lot of the great things that we've done. I understand that you had a moment where you found out about how much suicide there is with vets and that, oh. and that you had been working with- Well, it's um, 22 a day, that number's not okay. It's not okay, but you know what? It's, it's not fair to them also, but it's not fair like how they get treated when they come back. Like they should be making all the money, not us. And they're so selfless. Like they don't know me or my kid or anything. They leave us to go fight for us and just to make us feel comfortable. And yet, you know, we have Sylvester Stallone come in and talk to our group. And he said, look, I made Rambo or First Blood just to show like the issues that vets go through coming back from the Vietnam War. And guys are going through the same issues with the VA and when they come out, when they're transitioned. So it's not gotten better with the government, so it's gotta be on you. You've gotta change it. It's gotta come from between your ears and behind your ears and behind your rib cage. So it's so, heartbreaking, staggering. And, and a lot of times I'll say stuff in there in our group to our vets and they get so mad at me. And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to give another, and I'm like, I don't mind if you get pissed as long as we don't kill ourselves. Like Memorial Day, we have Memorial Day. And the first Memorial Day, I said, uh, what are you guys doing to celebrate Memorial Day this week? <laughs> they got so mad. <laughs> and uh, what? Uh, they get so pissed, we don't celebrate Memorial Day. This is when our brothers got killed. I said, I know, why aren't you celebrating them? And they were like, what? I said, why aren't you celebrating them? I said, listen, when I die, none of y'all are wearing black. Nobody here, you're gonna celebrate my life. You think your brothers are up there happy? If you're sitting there with a loaded gun on Memorial Day or a fifth of or Jack Daniels or something, or, or do you think they'd rather you celebrate them? So let's celebrate them. Let's celebrate our brothers and sisters. And we started taking a hike to get a little closer to brothers and sisters on, you know, on that day. And now our whole group, that's what they view it as. And they started going to the cemetery down here in LA, walking up to people saying, who are you celebrating? And trying to change that perspective. And it could start with one person that just changes the way. And we have a vet named Denver Morris, which really kind of led the charge on this. And a guy named AJ Perez were our first two employees. They really led the charge. When we started talking about it differently, they fought back hard. And then they said, wait, you know, it's kind of right. And yeah, why aren't we celebrating them? And I understand why our vets are angry and pissed. And I probably would be too if, if I was in a lot of their positions. Your work with MVP has made a real difference for and for the I folks so. that are in it in, in terms oh. of like how many have succumbed to suicide yeah. that are participating. Can you share kind of what that has looked like? Um, I just know there's a lot who are continuing it who haven't since. So I don't know the number. Um, I don't want to put a number on it, but there's an awful lot. And even if there's one, I'm like, yeah, it's amazing. Some of my best friends in there now are people who we're going to. We have a, a vet named Kirstie Ennis who's now trying to climb Everest, who's amazing. She called for permission one night to let her go. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna, not gonna say yes. Like, we need you and I think you're gonna help more people. She's like, you're not giving me permission. I said, no. And she's, you know how many people she's helped out since? Like, oh my God, she is, that girl's freaking walking here or walking blessing. Like, I'm minuscule and what I do talking about it. She has been incredible how many people she's helped out. And that's what you do. Like, you just never know. I have a, a thing in the book, you never know what lies around next Tuesday. And we brought little Logan in on our anniversary one year. Everybody raised their hand and said, Logan, so glad you helped start this. And they gave their story and what they would have done. That I was suicidal and I didn't. I'm so glad that you're still here, that you were able to start this with us. And they went around the room and Logan turned to me and he said, hey, Jay, it's pretty damn cool. <laughs> and I said, and I think he was 14 at the time. I said, I know Logan. I said, man, we, you never know what lies around next Tuesday. I said, who would have thought you getting leukemia would have ended up starting this whole beautiful foundation where we would save lives. And not only would people not commit suicide, but they would go on to do great things and to lift up and empower so many other people. And you never know what lies around next Tuesday. It's really interesting when I think about how much impact one change one person can have on so many people. Like yeah. what Logan's life 
did for you. And b by the way, I say you never know what lies around next Tuesday, because Tuesday, it was a Tuesday when I got that call from my agent, like, hey, you could exhale, you got your... You got a job. You got a job, yeah. But go ahead, I'm sorry. That impact, that ripple effect. Yeah, ripple effect, yeah. And And I, I think there's a weird thing about modern life and all the screens, where on one level, we're, we're so connected to so many more people, yeah. it, fe it seems like it, we should feel more impactful, and yet I feel no, like- we see more people, we're not connected. Right, and so it's, it's got yeah. this strange inverse effect yeah. in making us actually feel smaller instead of bigger. You don't even know if you're connecting with the person you're talking to. Right. It's scarier. Right. You're walking down dark alleys more than we ever have. The fundamental concept of this show is that as a dad, mm -hmm. as a man, if you're a dad, this is one of those one-to-one -one relationships, or one-to-many if you've got more than one kid, that you're gonna leave a giant ripple effect mm -hmm. in what you do. So how do you think about your role as a dad and that yeah. relationship with your kids? Uh, I think it's the most, most important job I've had, and I think I question myself most about, man, because there is no guidebook how to be a dad. We, I mean, there's books written on it, but come on, right? Guys don't read them. <laughs> but you're also, you're, you're your own story. No one else has your story. No one else has your story with your kid. So, you know, I ended up adopting my son. Um, Men in Movies 2, the day I broke the story of the end of the NFL lockout. And I broke that story at 3.52 in the morning, and then had to be at family court at nine, and there's no cell phone service in there. And my phone was, as you can imagine, just going. Just exploding. Yeah, it's just going nuts. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. I lean into people like Howie Long a lot. Like, hey, what do I do here? How do I do this? And here's the one thing I do. I tell my kid I love him constantly. Like, I, I don't want my kid to ever grow up being like, oh, my dad didn't say he loves me. I'm not gonna do that. It goes a long way. So that's the first thing. That's one thing I can control. I'm gonna show him and tell him I love him. So that's always been a constant for me, no matter what. Like a lot of people we talk to, um, you're a successful guy living a very busy yeah. life. How do you balance that yeah. with having time with, with your son? How well, do you that was, I always had the cell phone and it just became part of life. And it was one time I was refereeing one of his soccer games and I was getting a scoop and he was like, come on, dad. And I'm like, <laughs> and I tried to explain to him, hey man, you want to take these nice trips? Like, dad got to do this. I hope it showed him work ethic also, but at the same time, it does. It, it's, if you're in the public eye too, it, it makes it a lot harder on them. And like I've had people tell me, I mean, we won't go to our kids' games because it's not fair to them. Because our kids also like don't get the chance to just be and be average and struggle and get better if they got to be great or they suck to everybody else and it's not fair to them. And they didn't sign up for it. My, my kid didn't sign up to have Jay Glazer's you know, notoriety follow him at, at games. It's, it's funny you're saying that because just last week I was interviewing Jake Arrieta and he mm. lives in Austin and he coaches his, his kid's baseball team yeah. and I'm like, well, that must be quite a mm. thing when the other team shows up and Jake Arrieta's coaching. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what happened when I showed up? I showed my kid's first day of football and he's like, oh, God, you're embarrassing me. I'm like, how can I be embarrassed you? I'm freaking Jay Glazer, I'm on ballers, are you kidding me? <laughs> and he's like, go, go. But what I realized too, doesn't give him the ability to just be. They all expected him, well, since you've been around football your whole life, you must be great, better than everybody, and it's just, you know, you gotta it struggle. It the scales in a weird like way. Like I said, Michael Jordan didn't start in high school, right? So, like Michael Jordan worked his butt off, Kobe Bryant worked his butt off. All these people worked their butts off to get to where they are. You know, we have something in mixed martial arts called smoker fights, where we bring people in where no one's watching, they're just like in private gyms, and we'll let you fight so you can get your nerves the same nerves, but, like if you have any sort of fame or anything going in, it's tough. We do it on purpose so you can get those nerves out. But if you have a kid for somebody who has notoriety, they don't have the ability to have those. It's just, you're in the spotlight and they didn't sign up for it. So, you, I, so I talked to him about it. I actually had a talk with Mike Tomlin about it, how he handled his kids. And he said, man, I want you to talk to Sammy and tell him this, this, this. It, he was like, they don't have the ability to be average and get great at something. And if you can start something new, you're probably gonna be average to start and you gotta work to be great. Maybe you're great to start, but I always like to think, man, we just gotta work our butts off. Do you think that that's one of the things that makes it harder for kids to have that relentlessness, that they are yeah. confronted with so much, so much that looks like easy success that they can't, they don't, they can't deal with. Well, they see it's it hard. online. And I tell my son this all the time, if you wanna get there, you gotta work Everybody, not by a little, but by a lot. And it's the hours that you put in when no one's watching is what's gonna make you great. 
And that's what people are missing these days. And I'll, I'll tell you a great story on that. Um, I was with Sean Payton down in New Orleans. It was 10 o'clock at night on a Thursday. Everybody had been gone out of that facility for five hours. And at some point, Sean said, oh man, I left something in the office, we have to go back. And the office from the Saints facility is like 35 minutes. I'm like, dude, you're killing my social life. <laughs> like, you know, I have five cocktails in, I'm like, you're killing me, because we have to go back. We go all the way back to the Saints facility. We got there at about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and there's one line on the whole place. And it's the tight ends room, but it's Drew Brees, and he's sitting there by himself. And he's watching film, and he's taking notes. I said, what are you doing, dude? And he goes, sometimes trying to be great is lonely. And I said, yeah. I am so stealing that from you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the truth of it. And everybody does things now to have a moment on social media. And instead of putting in those hours that no one's gonna see, everything's about a moment for everybody to see. And that's not how we become great. We become great by putting those hours in when no one's watching. How do you talk to your son about your challenges with I'm mental health? I'm so open. And he struggled also. And we're open about it. Are there things you do, like I know, I know Guys don't like to actually look like this, so I've been I've been told that like, you want to talk to a boy, go on a walk. Both right. be looking in the same direction. Again, I didn't open up about this till the book, so I didn't really have the words until this. And it's one of the things I wrote it so I could have the words, so other people could have the words to have start having these conversations. So I have, and like so, like my my son hits me up recently. School is a struggle for him the same way that it is for me. He has ADHD and he's processing issues. And I, man, I, school is like, man, I was in remedial English for my whole life. And now I've written two books, by the way. So I was looking at Making like, progress. Yeah, it's more the way you guys teach than I learn. And that's what I told my son, too. I said, dude, school is harder for people like us. And he, he said, to me, man, how do I, how am I ever going to be successful if I can't be good in school? And I said, people have different ways of coaching and learning. I obviously had a hard time learning the way I was taught too. But you've heard me coach, right? I could coach. But a lot of those teachers who kind of put me down, probably, and I love teachers, um, just some of the ones who, <laughs> when I first told my ADD, I love teachers I was, in general. I, they thought I was making it up. I said to them, you know, we, um, some of those teachers probably wouldn't learn the way I coach. Probably wouldn't resonate with them. How I coach fighters and football players may not resonate. Know it going in that it's harder for us than everybody else, and be proud for anything you are. As long as you work your butt off, I don't care what your grades say. I just want you to work your butt off. I want to know that. That's an A++++. And for me to get, I had a 2.3 average, and I did work hard for it. It was just hard for me. School was hard for me. Yeah. I couldn't remember anything. School's, couldn't not, school's not built for boys. No, it's K through 12 in it's particular. Not to just sit there and be told things that are boring, for, you know, as you get older, they're three hour periods and just sit there like, it's, man, it's not conducive. But show me something and I can then turn around and coach it to someone. I got a photographic memory. I pick it up in two seconds, bam. That's the way I know I can learn. So I told him also, look, whatever your grades are, they are as long as you're working your butt off and is there anything else we could do? Or you, do you, do we get more tutors? And is there another way we can learn? Something along those lines, as long yeah. as he, puts it all in that, I'm proud of him, happy. I shared with him all my struggles. So he didn't feel, he doesn't feel alone with that. What's the biggest thing you've learned from your son? Um, forgiveness. Man, I've had some meltdowns and he just still loves me, you know? And uh, no, I can't. <laughs> it's hard to talk, it's, man. I've had some, you know, again, I've had mental health breakdowns in front of him and uh, he just loves me the same. Very cool. Isn't that the best gift of being no, a dad? No doubt. No doubt. And he's, he's been really compassionate toward me when I've opened up about everything. And, and he's told me he's proud of me. So that's, uh, that's better than any award we can get. A lot of us struggle with anger. Is that something you've struggled with? And how have you? Hell yeah, it's something I struggle with. <laughs> because you're frustrated. I'm so grateful I'm doing my podcast because I didn't know anybody else who did this until I had Michael Phelps on. I tend to self-harm where I punch myself in the head, I hurt myself, and Michael Phelps on my on our interview on, on the Unbreakable uh, podcast said he took a golf cleat one time and hit himself in the head. I was like, 
oh, it's not just me. Oh my God, I'm 53. It's the first time I heard anybody else tell me that. There's a scene in the MVP movie where Nate yeah. is just beating the hell out of himself. I think I learned that from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a self-harmer in that way. And um, I try not to hurt others, and especially as you kind of got more and more involved in mixed martial arts, it kind of gave you the know-how not to do anything. Yeah, what did being a fighter teach you about managing aggression? Taught you to be a lot more secure in yourself. And somebody says something to you, like, all right, you're a cute kid and you can walk away. Why? Why, why, did, that, why did being a fighter teach you how to control your power? It just makes you a lot more secure in what you're able to do when you walk in a room. So you know you can handle yourself in the ring, I mean, so somebody I mean, comes, yeah, steps yeah. up to you, you're like, yeah. I, I don't need right. to prove anything to you. Yes, I mean, I sat there and got my handed me my Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture and the Jay Harons of the world and, you know, Tyron Woodley's and, you know, to Rashad Evans and Shell Sonnen and goes on and on and on. We're okay over here. I'm good. But, but also I know, like, I don't need to show my manhood with this cat because I've done it a million times over here. But also the way I view fighting our team, try and make it like we don't care if we win or lose. We can care less. We take the ego out of it. We just want to make it the worst afternoon for you when you walk in there. So even when I'm training my guys, I kind of giggle to myself, like, oh man, this is about to suck for this cat. Now they may win, but it's gonna suck for you. And it just gives us this relentless attitude. And same thing, I, I kind of use that in life. I'm just relentless, 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 relentless. I want them in that case, you go, oh my God, enough. Like, why is he keep coming forward? Why does he keep walking forward? Just get off, get off me already. And I've used the same approach in life. And it's kind of that relentlessness, not afraid to win or lose, or to get hurt, or to get beat up, has allowed me to get to where I am. That's the getting knocked down and getting rejected and uh, taking lumps. And I lost every day on the way up, but it turned out I won in, in the end. Yeah. The thing that, I, that I'm left with as I think about what we've been talking about is, you know, relentlessness is mm -hmm. this theme up throughout it. it. You talk about it in yeah. the book as like this essential thing to this unbreakable mindset. Yeah. But it also seems like there's a darker side if, you've, if you're in an environment like, professional sports or no, being in the military. No, we're more ourselves. Well, when does that relentlessness go? How do, you, how do you redirect the kind of intensity that it takes when you're in, these, in the ring, on the field? That's where you find those teams. And that's where you open up and you talk about it. Whether it's therapists, and I tell people, I tell sports teams now, we gotta be a lot more proactive about our mental health, not as reactive. Pro like, and we need to get more proud of our mental health scars. When you break your arm, you put a cast on, everybody signs it, right? We're excited. We don't do the same thing with mental health. I am now clearly doing it. And I tell these guys, you don't just run 40s when you think you get slow. You don't just catch passes when you think you have the drops. You do it every single day of your life. You gotta do the same thing with mental health. There's probably not enough therapists out there for us yet, and you gotta start looking at therapists, coaches. So until then, let's start leaning into each other. So let's start using that darkness and to share it with each other and open up because it'll probably lighten somebody else's load also. And so, that darkness gets a lot lighter when you start sharing it. So it's not about dialing back how relentless you are. It's about, no. it's about how to direct it. Yeah, you keep doing it, but also you want to take, and even like my pain, I take my pain and I use it to motivate me for something else. But now I know to have an outlet for the pain too, and that's talking using the words, opening up to anybody and everybody. Talking about it on national television, talking about it with my son, talking about it with a group of combat vets, talking about it with everybody else. That vulnerability, that's what makes me strong. Me and Randy Couture choking each other in the cage is not the strongest thing I do. This is the strongest thing I do. Wow, that's really powerful. For sure. What about pranks? You're oh, yeah. a legendary prankster. Yeah, because laugh, that? laughter is what I gotta do to get myself out of this a lot. So when I'm having a panic attack on TV, again, I'll, I'll push out a joke because I need to laugh a lot. I'll play jokes on people. And What's know. the craziest prank you've ever pulled? So I take everybody's phone, and if you're, now they know, so it doesn't happen anymore. But I used to take people, and Strand was the first the guy I got. And your phone, I'll, if it's unlocked, I'll take it, and I'll send somebody a text message from your phone, and then I'll erase the sent message so you don't know you send it. <laughs> So I've had Strahan oh, oh, no. reveal a lot of really compromising things about himself to a lot of people. And then they'll call back and be like, are you serious? Am I serious about what? Are you serious about this and this? And he's like, what are you talking about? I didn't say that. You just texted it to me. So, yeah. 
I texted Randy Couture from Chuck Liddell's phone that he took a Viagra before their second fight because he wanted to take their relationship to the next level. And then <laughs> just sit there and this text comes back, hey, these are the two baddest dudes on the planet. And the text comes back and it just says, what? Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. And Chuck's like, what is this? I go, you might have texted someone. Yeah, I've, I've gotten uh, a slew of bumper stickers. I put them on Howie Long's car, and because no one messes with Howie. So I'll put these bumper stickers on his car. They're really, really raunchy. And he drives around Beverly Hills. It's Howie Long. Like, no one does it to Howie Long. And I do it to Howie Long. And it, man, the other guys just die laughing. They crack up. So it's hard to be friends with Jay Glazer. <laughs> oh, man. You're an optimist, aren't you? Oh. Or are you? I don't know about that. Yeah, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I always think the world is crashing down around me, so I don't know if that's an optimist. I just gotta deal with that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm always thinking the sky is falling. That's what my depression does to me. So that's the way you feel. I'm a fighter and I fight back against it. That's I've, how I feel, yeah. I've seen you say that the universe conspires to help us, though. Yeah, yeah. So how does that fit? I learned fit? that MVP. How does that fit into that? Because I feel like the like the universe is crashing and everybody hates me and everything hates me and the universe wants bad for me and then I know, I, I reason with myself, I talk it out, I'm like, no, like if the universe is really against us, we'd all be dead. That's true. Right? Yeah. We all go through a tragedy that would befall us every single second of our lives. It's not true. These are the lessons of the Jersey Shore. You go in the ocean. <laughs> you go in the ocean, you're like, that you thing You stuck could... with a hypodermic needle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. It's funny, no one's ever asked me that. My fight's every day. So then I think that, make, that means you choose to be an optimist in the face of a lot of negativity. I'm choosing to fight back against it. And yeah, I'm choosing to fight back. And now I have these tools. And even like, listen, I'm 53, I just got engaged. Um, oh, congratulations. Beautiful Rosie Tennyson, the Tennyson twins. She and her sister are the Doubleman twins, remember them. <laughs> and um, but it's the first time in my life I haven't pushed someone away, haven't sabotaged. Because when you feel unworthy, you tend to sabotage and you're gonna speed up what you think is already intended to happen to you. That's, that's pessimistic, it's not optimistic. So I'm like, well, this person's gonna leave me anyway, so let me speed it up. So I've done that to everybody else I've ever been with. This is the first time in my life, and again, I'm 53, I wanna show people it's not too late. First time in my life I've ever truly found, felt this love where it's gonna last, it's gonna be here, and it's forever. And to her, I open it up to her. I had a little meltdown like two, three weeks ago, and she was like, hey, 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 I'm not going anywhere. I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. And that's the first time someone's ever really done that for me. I've talked to a lot of psychologists on the show, and one of the things that I've, heard, I've learned is that just to rephrase something from I feel this way to I am having the feel feeling, way, yeah. like my mind yeah. is telling me I feel like, wrapping it up so that what, that part of your brain that knows you're not gonna, you're not gonna die mm -hmm. recognizes the part that feels that you are. Right, right, right. And right. you've talked about that a lot. Yeah. Is that part of what you do is you remind yourself that this part oh, that's- Oh, I have a whole thing that I do. Every day I get up, I have this whole thing. I do this breath work and this meditation and I write a gratitude list of 10 things I'm grateful for from the day before every day, before I ever look at my phone every day. And before I go to bed every day, I do this little breath work meditation and I kind of throw a party in my heart. I celebrate three things that have happened that day that's been great. I throw a party. I really, really like meditate, let it fill me up and it's better to go to sleep and just come back from a party and often will lead to bluer skies when you wake up the next day. That's great advice. Thank you. Last question. I ask this of every guest. You know, you've broken a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about your role in the American story? Ma'am, the American story? Yeah. We um, all play a role. I hope that I'm somebody that starts a trend that gave us words to start talking about our mental health so it could lead to a lot more mental peace for us moving forward. And since I have come out and talked, and I think a lot of people want to talk about it, they just didn't know, didn't know the words, didn't know how to say it. You now see people doing it and becoming a lot more normal. So I'm hoping I will have saved a lot of lives and empowered a lot of lives and inspired a lot of people and lifted people up and they in turn will do the same for others and others and others and others. So that's what I could hope for. Jay, thanks for being on Dad Saves America. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, brother.